It's really nice to meet you, Tabitha. I'm Alita. I'm the CEO of the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. And I'm the CEO of the Beeson Family Foundation. So we've come together to talk about philanthropy, social justice, the law, the role of arts and culture in promoting human rights. There's so many things to talk about. Everything, basically. Yeah, that's and right. And the everything, world and everything else. Everything that's important. One of the things I did um, want to ask was when the title Human Rights Arts and Film Festival was decided upon, what's the arts component? Because I've seen the films mm. and I've been to some of the um, opening nights and you know seen the huge crowd that gathers to talk about the film, but the arts component. We have probably about... 15 or 20 arts events annually. Yeah. So these are art exhibitions, photography exhibitions, um, you know, musical acts and whatnot. So all of these have human rights themes. It's just yeah. a different way that we try and, you know, bring human rights to life. Because I hadn't appreciated that. I, I knew about the film festival and I'd seen... Um, films which we'd funded through philanthropy because they were touching on issues around refugee rights, um, Indigenous rights. So when I would see those films appear in the lineup, you know, I sort of appreciated the, the significance of the festival. But it goes all year round. Is that what you're...? Well, we have a year round program, but during the actual festival period and the tour, we put on special art exhibitions with partners. So right. we tend to rally partners before the event, yep. you know, well in advance and, and see if anybody has anything that would align with some of the human rights themes that are coming up that they'd be interested in partnering with. Just because I think when it comes to making human rights come to life for people, yep. many different audiences will, you know, respond to different mediums in different ways. So Yeah, different causes and then different mediums. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, photography is a very powerful one in this space. Music is another powerful one if you think about, you know, you know, the peace protest songs in the past. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we just try to bring it alive through so many different mediums. It's one of the things, I saw a film on Saturday night called um, The Last Flag Flying. Have you seen that? It's no, one of um, Richard Linklater's new films and he did Boyhood. And it's incredibly poignant and, and quite, it's, it's beautiful. It's one of those films which sort of covers comedy and tragedy and it's poignant and it's sort of very much that, you know, human experience, but it ends with a Bob Dylan song playing as the credits roll up. And I always associate his voice with, you know, political messaging and, and in a positive way. And so I hadn't thought of, of music until you mentioned it then, just how much it plays a role. With the film, do you find that um, there's a, an increasing appetite for these causes to be played out in film? What do you see as the medium that's gaining the most traction? Um... Yeah, I do actually feel, I, I feel like that there's lots of mediums that are attracting, I'll just, sorry, I'll answer the question again. Um, I think that film is an attractive medium yeah. for for a lot of these human rights themes. I um, previously worked at the World Bank and also the NGO, the International Women's Development Agency. Yeah. Both those places are dealing with very complex issues of poverty or human rights and yeah. I know in both those cases they you know they found that film was a very very effective medium in getting getting things across yeah so because we, of that immediacy of being able to actually see people's experience yeah the immediacy and also you know if you're dealing with a very big a human rights issue, often you'll get statistics that are, can be quite staggering, whether it's, you know, how many women in a country have experienced um, gendered violence or, yes. you know, um, other statistics about um, family planning. They're, you know, they're often re at a very large scale that people can't relate to. There's actually, um, I forget what the effect is called, but there is an effect where when you give people a a statistic, it, it becomes so in, incomprehensible to them because it's beyond their 
their frame of reference. Yeah. You know, they can't imagine it. Yeah, and you see, you see different ways in which statistics statistics are presented to try and create that um, ability to conceptualise. So you'll hear people talk in terms of, you know, this much rubbish would feel the MCG this many times, yeah. or you know, logged logged wood would, and they try and kind of create. Um, a measurement that you can then say, oh, right, I understand now what the impact is. Yeah, so you can imagine it or else yeah. it, it becomes almost impossible to imagine. And I think we saw that um, quite a lot while we were looking at, you know, the huge amount of people seeking asylum, um, you know, the largest flow of people since World War II. Yeah. And there all these statistics coming out and yeah. everyone was sort of, you know, couldn't necessarily relate to it, it was just way too big. And then the photo of Eilon Kurdi, who was the poor young boy who was found dead on the beach, showed up. And yeah. all of a sudden it it put a human face to a very, yeah. very big issue. And people could see the consequences yeah. of, of, of this, this movement of people because of global conflict, yeah. which probably was harder for them to really get that sense of the impact so immediately. I mean, that, I think everyone looked at that picture and just felt complicit in a way yeah. that, that that had been allowed to happen. And And we felt, oh, I know I certainly did, but what if this was my child or, yeah. you know, how how can this, I, I felt, how can this happen in the world? It, it really made it human and it that that galvanises people and I think that that's, in answer to your question earlier, that's what film does. It, yeah. it, it makes it real, it humanises these really difficult, complex issues and um, once people develop that emotional connection to something, you know, that's really when people change their minds and that's really when they come to act. Yeah, and that was one of the things I know, you know we've talked about before, that idea that you know, people will often um, look at different issues as they're playing out in the media and will think, oh, well, that's the responsibility of you know, that commission or that government department or that NGO and they won't necessarily see a role for themselves. But if you can make um, human rights more about you know, the everyday experience of people, then you can see the role that you can play in the way you treat the people around you, what you're willing to, um, you know, to advocate for on behalf of others. You start to get a sense of how important it is to not turn a blind eye to injustice when you see it, you know, occurring. And I think that's one of the really valuable roles of the festival as well, is that it gives people, you would hope, that courage to say, actually, I need to really live by my values and by my ethics and not just separate them into, you know, this is, these are terrible things that are happening over which I have no control um, and then here's my life. It's sort of almost blending the two a bit more together. Yeah, yeah, it, you're absolutely right because we've surveyed people after they've come out of the festival and they have said that it's led them to action or conversations in the community. So, you know, yeah. people have walked out having an emotional connection, feeling something and then mostly going on to do something about it. Yeah, yeah, and feeling in, emboldened by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, cause I was looking at the themes that you've focused on. So this festival is the 11th, isn't it? That's so right. So that's the film festival itself, is it? Yes, or, yeah. yes. And so I had a look on the website because we talked about some of the different themes and they're strong themes. They're not ones to shy away from. There's, um, if I've got them correctly, there's Indigenous rights, women's rights, environment, um, global conflict and then the shift of populations as a result of global conflict. Yes. And then uh, justice and retribution, yes. which is a huge <laughs> issue. And I was really curious about, you know, who sat down and debated what themes to focus on or which causes to, um, you know, really shine a light on. And then having decided that, how do you then find the content to align with those, those areas? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the themes that we've come up with this year are a product of basically going out to the audience and the community that's been involved in Haraf and consulting with them and asking them what issues are most important for you. Right. Um, and and making sure it was, it was reflecting the genuine community concerns and what... Right. What's what, on people's minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there were a few things that weren't picked up in that, but 
that are still important issues to cover, such as the rights of people with disabilities. So oh, yes, of course. Yep. We've made sure other issues that are really important that might not have been reflected in that consultation are also represented right. there as well. So yep. um, it, it is really difficult because there are so many issues that you could focus on. So going forward next year, what we'll probably do is we've also we've also got a programming team. So they they were given sort of the themes once we'd got it through our consultation process right, yep. and teams of programmers then reviewed all the content accordingly. Yes. So sometimes we went out to filmmakers and sometimes filmmakers would submit to the festival and everyone would review it and then rank it to see what... So what the, the strength of the piece of, of film itself yes. and then whether it does fit in one of the different yeah, and categories. Whether, right. And whether it fits into the festival at all. So we get yeah. uh, probably... I don't know, 10 times more films than we can actually feature. So yeah. um, having that framework around it's really helpful. And then going forward next year, we'll have really, really, really strong community participation on that, those committees, yeah. so that, you know, the different groups that are actually having their issues and rights represented are actively deciding which ones would be most helpful to them. And did you put suggestions forward for them to choose from? Because if someone said to me, what are the issues that are, you know, front of mind for you with a human rights focus, um, you know, I would probably think about things like, you know, access to affordable housing, access to education, healthcare, but wouldn't have probably articulated the ones that, that the festival's chosen, which when I think about it now, having been presented with them, to me seem incredibly valuable and strong and, you know, requiring that lens. Yeah. So were there categories put forward that people could choose from? There were categories put right. forward. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, there was also a space where people could put forward other things if they weren't um, mentioned as well. There was an, an other category yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. people could suggest. And then the other thing I was really curious about was where you're looking at, at the content, um, what are the different ways in which you assess the strength of a film? Because everyone has a different reaction to a film and it's always a surprise when you read a review after you've seen a film and, and, and the reviewers had a very different response that you, to the one that you've had. And yeah. you sort of think, oh, it's you know, almost like we saw a different film. So how do you do that within um, that festival uh, sort of you know environment in, in the in in the curating part. yeah the curation yeah yeah so we have groups that work on each one and then they come and have a discussion about it and rank each one and sort of decide amongst themselves which ones are rising to the top and are resonating right. the most so yeah. you know it's a quite a diverse committee so yeah yeah it's and are a, they volunteers or are they, they they are volunteers so a lot most of them are film students or oh, are, right. actually quite a few of them work for other arts organizations as well and yep. want to be involved in that aspect of it as well oh, that's that's good because then you've got their they're obviously going to have um their own ideas of you know what a film what a good film looks like, sounds like, you know, the, the impact that it has. One of the things I found interesting with the festival two years ago was that um, I previously was working at an organisation which was the trustee for a huge number of trusts and a lot of the um, directions that the founders had left, because the trust had been set up, you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, didn't use the language around human rights because that wasn't really a term that was used back when these trusts were established. But it was clearly the intent that these trusts would be used to alleviate disadvantage um, or, you know, address inequality or to just try and ensure that, that people weren't being left behind. You know, you could yeah. sort of see, you know, the good intent would be expressed in, in language that was reminiscent of that time. And at that uh, point, Chasing Asylum, the film about the experience of detainees on Manus and, and Christmas Island, were, was being filmed. And so... I was very keen to, to see that film supported and we were trying to sort of carve out a role for philanthropy to play and in the end what we funded was a um, sort of what you can do campaign so that someone who'd seen the film was then given a website to go to if they wanted to write to their local politician um, or they could hold a screening locally and invite you know the community to come and see this film. And it was basically giving them um, actions that they could take if they felt moved by the film and then wanted to act. And that's often 
you know, one of the important things that philanthropy can do is it can kind of help, it can galvanise advocacy, it can, it can really step in and, and try and, you know, progress issues. And I was curious about whether um, you've built that into the festival, that idea that on the back of any given film, is there some kind of platform or some kind of way in which... Um, they can act. Yeah, they can yeah. act. With some we have, so we've got some really key partners such as the International Women's Development Agency and Plan Australia where there's a direct relationship there and then some we're still, you know, um, developing going forward. But I think this is a really important area to, you know, ensure that people when they have when they do feel something about these topics can do something helpful or... Yeah, you know, at least know where to go yeah, if yeah. they do want to contribute or to, you know, to join the movement, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think we'll do that going forward into the next year. Yeah, and I always have these visions of, you know, because the millennial generation is so much more sophisticated when it comes to building online platforms and linking in, you know, various, you know, sources, that might actually be something that that, that generation kind of pushes forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think... It, you know, what I'd really like to see is a, a bit of a coalition around the themes yeah. that are brought up. So it brings in a whole range of community organisations, NGOs, spokespeople, activists and, you know, the filmmakers bringing, you know, because it, you've got a lot of people working in these spaces yeah. but they're quite yeah. it's quite siloed still so yeah absolutely and, and and often you need I mean something like a documentary or a film will be the catalyst for people who aren't working in that space to say I really want to be involved yeah. or it would be you know um, I, I would feel uh, that I couldn't walk away now and not do something yeah. and so to then be able to draw in well who are the not-for-profits or the NGOs working in this space what are the different campaigns that are on foot What's the government's position on some of the policies that might impact on this, you know, situation, depending on which it is, would be a really, it would actually make the festival um, sort of that talking point and then you've got the ripple effect. Yeah, yeah, I think this is a tremendous idea. I think it, it really moves the festival into promoting greater action yeah. and connecting people. Yeah, and giving them that opportunity to act, which yeah. I think a lot of people feel... Well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm moved by these issues, but how do I, in my day to day life, go about and you know do anything about it? Which is one of the reasons why, you know, in working in philanthropy, I've always said um, to the clients that I used to advise on setting up, you know, a charitable trust or setting up a, a vehicle, that it just gives them that ability to say, I am doing something because I've set up a trust, I've put funds aside, I know I have to give away this much income every year. And now I'm going to sit down and actually articulate, you know, with my family or my friends or the, my work colleagues, what are the issues that we feel strongly about, and then find the opportunities to try and progress those issues and make that regular commitment. And then the structure of that actually creates its own momentum. And then it satisfies that desire that people have to feel that they're, they're making a difference. And I think people often get overwhelmed by these issues and think mm. this is just you know, incredibly difficult. How do I even, you know, begin to make a difference? And so that's where I think, you know, setting up a trust or setting up a, a family foundation really gives them that that opportunity to do that. That's one of the reasons why I love working in philanthropy because you're basically saying to people, it's not just about the, you know, donation of money. There are so many different ways people can get involved, but you're just trying to give them that access and yeah. the opportunity. So I imagine you've seen some really touching stories in your work through philanthropy. What are what are some of the standouts for you? Yeah, look, the, I had a really interesting experience establishing the giving program for Sir Reginald Ansett's trust, and he had set that up. And the direction that he'd left the trustees was um, that he wanted the funds to be used to assist children to take their place in life. And I was given, you know, the task of articulating, you know, what what might we fund to achieve that aim, given that that's the direction that the trustees then have. And it was really interesting to reflect on what is it that actually enables a child to reach his or her potential. And, you know, this vast range of programs that would come within that. And, you know, not to detract from any of the ideas that were put to us, but a lot of them I felt were were soft options. So things like, you know, outward bound camp um, and, you know, no um, discredit to anyone who's gone through an outward bound camp, but... Or, you know, different um, 
opportunities where I thought these are really nice to have. These are lovely opportunities, and I can see how they could really lend. Um, they could enable a child to develop and, and you know have this um, this kind of you know breadth of experience. But in consultation with the children's commissioner, who at that time was Bernie Geary, he really brought to our attention the situation with children who were in um, state care, where, mm -hmm. you know, because of their um, parents' inability to parent them, they had, um, and the option of foster care or kinship care hadn't been um, available, they were living in, in state care. And then what that then meant for them in terms of their trajectory and the risk of them becoming, you know, um, statistics. So statistics um, in terms of unemployment, or homelessness, or drug and alcohol addiction, or you know, um, low educational outcomes. And to me, that really resonated because I thought these children aren't getting the experience that a lot have, where the network that that sits around them um, really guides them through into adulthood. You know, they were being exited out of the the state care system at, at eighteen. And you look at yeah. you know your own experience with being an eighteen year old and how little idea you had about you know how to navigate the world so that for me was a really interesting turning point because it started to focus my attention more on where are the vulnerable cohorts and then how do you try and fund programs that are really focusing specifically in on those problems and often what will happen is philanthropy can only play um, you know, a role within the, the financial means of philanthropy. It's usually government who are the bigger player. I mean, always yeah. the bigger player. Yeah. When you see these announcements in the paper about, you know, these new pledges that are being made to, you know, different initiatives and, you know, you're talking, you know, multi-million dollar yeah. you know, commitments. Well, philanthropy can make million dollar commitments, but they're not as common as the ones that, you know, government makes. And so often the role that philanthropy plays is to try and identify the problems and then advocate the solutions or show the solutions working by funding trial projects yeah. or pilots. Yeah. And then you take the evidence from those um, pilots or from, you know, you take the advocacy of the people who are, you know, having first-hand experience and then you take it to government and say, all right, here are some of the solutions to the problems. And they can scale it up. And they can scale yeah. it up. And so in the case of, you know, kids in state care, a lot of the trusts and foundations that were working in that space said one of the big problems is that the children are being pushed out of the system at age 18 and they're being pushed out at a time where they probably most need that additional support and, and you know, care. And so now there's a, a campaign to increase the age to 21. Okay. So you see a very practical outcome from what's identified as a, as a problem. So, yeah, that was, a, that was a, an that interesting example. That is very, very interesting. Um, our opening night film yeah. uh, it touches on some of this stuff, but a very different perspective on it. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, um, Aboriginal children are removed um, from their homes at a, a much, much higher yeah, rate. Yeah, it's, it's dis that's right. It's disproportionate in terms of the, the population. It's yeah. actually... Over-representation, I think. It's, it's actually it's, staggering. The, the documentary... Um, says that if it continues at the same rates, by um, 2025, the rates will have been higher than the previous stolen generation. So yeah. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things that this, this film posited, posits as a solution is, you know, in some cases children do need to be removed, but there's no reason that they can't be kept in the community, yeah, you know, yeah, with, yeah. with their grandparents or aunties. And that, yeah. that connection's really strong in providing that, you know, that, you know, that continuity until yeah. you go into your early 20s. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the idea that, okay, if there are additional supports and services need, you know, needed, you know, can it be um, delivered in more of a, a wraparound manner within the community yeah. rather than this idea of, you know, just being displaced from that community? Yeah. And then, you know, there's then all the different ways in which you would enact that. And with that film, I, I saw in the review something about there being four grandmothers. Is that is that the theme of that film? That yeah, or, yeah. Or so story? it's... Um, it, there's four grandmothers who their grandchildren had been removed and they were yeah. fighting the system to get their grandkids back and saying, hey, well, we can... We can, we look, can look after them. We can look after them. We want to yeah. look after them. It, it's actually... Um, yeah, it's... it's it, it, it's heartbreaking. 
it's yeah. heartbreaking. But I think the film offers some really good solutions yeah. as well. Yeah. And it, it is empowering to see these grandmothers that have sort of banded together. They, you know, they're facing an injustice. They've banded together and they've said, well, we're not, we're not, we're not going to put up with this. So. Yeah, and you can, you can imagine that. I mean, it's, as you say, it's that idea of it being um, an experience which the audience can picture themselves in. You know, that, I mean, that was one of the things that really I found difficult about a film I watched recently, and it was showing um, a whole group of, of, you know, what would probably be termed by the government economic refugees, so people who've, you know, fled their country with their children and with their families to try and, you know, create a better life elsewhere. And there's this sort of punitive approach that's taken to, to that, which I find really difficult because you can imagine yourself in that, in that situation where, you know, your greatest sense of responsibility is to your children and all you want to do is provide them with protection and security and opportunity yeah. and then you're being punished for that in a way which seems completely um it's, i mean it, it, i don't really understand how people can not see themselves in that circumstance and think yes of course i would do the same thing and yeah. can you imagine the powerlessness that you would feel as a parent when it's not like you know if you and i were in a, in a situation where you know we were being subjected to injustice or um you know circumstances which which we would then as adults talk about how we're going to deal with this but but with children who don't have that maturity or that ability to understand what's happening and then the parent having the responsibility of trying to manage their experience, but in a system that's not giving them any sense of power or any sense of say. You know, I, I just find it, um, it's difficult for me to understand why people aren't more empathetic and compassionate towards those groups. Do you think that it could be something to do with the language that and how, you know, I feel when it comes to a lot of these human rights issues, um, it's sort of this fear or demonisation of the other that's created through this constant rhetoric, economic refugees and, yeah. you know, the flip side of an economic Tree refugee. Jumpers yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things that yeah. make them, you know. The make, other, yeah, you know. Absolutely. It makes them scary. It makes them, it looks like, you know, that they're taking something away from us, that they're a threat. You know, all these things that... Um, you know, people have been whipped up into a bit of a frenzy about it that yeah. they can't, I don't think they can look past it. It's um Yeah, I think I think the you know, self preservation is such a driving instinct that, that people have. And I think if you use language that makes people feel that their security or safety is gonna be threatened, they will respond to that yeah. um more quickly than the compassion. I mean there are obviously you know exceptions to every rule, but I think that's where that rhetoric is, is very damaging because what it's basically saying is um, you have the right to uh, treat these people differently because it's the right thing to do for the safety of your family or your yeah. country or your community. And so it's it's sort of giving people that permission to, to act in a way that's self-interested and not and it, not compassionate. It, it is and it perpetuates this myth that you know, being kind and inclusive and all of these things would threaten the economic stability. And, I, you know, interestingly, you know, I used to work at the World Bank and one of the things mm. that I used to have to do was look at the economics of some of these human rights topics like gender equality yeah, yeah. and other human rights topics. So, you know, when people are unequal or they're being discriminated against, it hurts everybody. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not just the right thing to do to, you know, treat people like humans with dignity. It's it's also it also makes sense for countries to do it economically. Yeah. It promotes everything becomes stronger if yeah. you can actually, you know, approach things with that kind of lens. And yet it's it's not the case. Or well, it's not how people, you know, view it. There were some statistics that were going around. I, I can't recall them, but it was talking about um, refugees that come to Australia. Yeah. They're more likely to set up a business. They're less likely to commit a crime. You know, the data, the data is so different to the rhetoric. It's, yes, yes. It's a massive departure yeah. where people can't look past it. And I guess that's where 
you know, that's where it becomes very polarised. And then you've got something like the festival that can come in between and put the human face to it all and sort of just create a bridge, you know? Yeah. And how do you make it accessible to people? Because you'll always have the people who identify as being um, interested in human rights. Yeah. And, you know, and some might, you know, accuse them of being, you know, Chardonnay lefties or yeah. some people might say, oh, well, that's, you know, the the bleeding hearts or, you know, there's always a tendency for, for people to sort of, you know, categorise. But where you've got um, a festival with such important issues um, playing out, how do you make that accessible? What's some of those, the tactics that you use? Do you mean the actual content or...? I think just um, making it seem like something that should be on people's go-to list or, you know, okay. calendar. Yeah. yeah, so what we do is we appeal to the different potential audiences through, yeah. through you know, their specific channels and through language which is very, very inclusive yeah. so that, yeah. you know, people can feel a part of something and and enjoy it and yeah. and feel good about it. Yeah, and then also the um, experience that people have is positive. I mean, that, that was my experience last year and the year before was there was this great sort of energy and, and you know, excitement about, you know, what, what people were being presented with. And so it builds. Do you get a greater audience each year? Yes, and oh, also good. in the second week. So we tend to get a bit of, you know, at the start we have a certain amount and then it grows exponentially as the festival goes along as well. So yeah. I and think people do care. Yes. <laughs> people do care. I was just, yes, I was I just in, in a, a Uber on the way here and I was talking to the guy there who was really conservative. You know, he was saying mm. some very conservative things mm. and the reason why he was, um, he was, he was being quite angry about when I was talking about human rights with him. Mm. And then it got to the point where he was saying that he was living in a difficult situation because he was in his 60s and he couldn't, he was finding it difficult to get a job. And yeah. that's when, you know, that's when I was able to have that discussion with him and go, well, that, that you know, that means that you're being discriminated against when you're applying yeah, for jobs. Yeah, that's right. Your financial your security is impacted yeah. because of the perception of the, you know, the, the job market. Or, yeah, you know. well, and because people are saying, well, you know, that's age discrimination yeah. and that's a violation of your rights and you yes. can exercise your rights. So, yeah. you know, I think that people see human rights as this big lofty thing. Yeah, aspirational yeah. And, and something that's dealt with by the United Nations. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's right, rather than it being something that's about everyday existence. And, yeah. It's yeah. about it's about being human. It's about, you know, the bare minimum yeah. way we should treat each other as human beings so that to promote dignity and equality yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. respect and, yeah. and you know discrimination, you know, being something that's that's identified for what it is. Yeah. I, I find it fascinating because I used to work in uh, at a public interest legal um, clearinghouse. So we would be um, receiving calls from the public and they would identify different issues where they saw a public interest you know, component. And, you know, we had you know, these fascinating discussions about, well, is that in the public interest and or is that just someone protecting their own interests? Or, you know, and you'd have to try and work through, you know, what was um, the cases that should be progressed and we would then assign um, pro bono lawyers and barristers. So you, you had to make the decisions, you know, with, with regard to merit and means. And, and yeah, and it was fascinating just getting this sense of the different things that people um, are indignant about. And quite often the role that, you know, public interest litigation had to play or, or advocacy was that if a large group of people had a common interest but that it wasn't great enough to drive them to advocate, so say it might be something like, you know, a, a pharmaceutical being um, subsidised by the government and, yeah. and, you know, the individual says, oh, look, I, you know, I, I don't think I should be paying for this, but they're not going, on the back of it being, say, you know, X number of dollars extra a month, they're not going to go and mount a challenge, you yeah. know, in, in, yeah. the, in the courts. Um, and that's where you need this sort of, you know, the, the power of the people to say, well, we all feel that this is something that's of, you know, significance and then you need your um, organisations or your, your NGOs to then sort of take that initiative and, and go and, you know, run it on behalf of, you know, this, this cohort. But it's fascinating to see the different drivers that, that motivate people. Yeah. And, you know, and often, you know, it might take something like a film, I guess, to make people aware of other people's experience. Yeah. And even that maybe that they've got rights that aren't being realised themselves. Yeah. You yeah. know, because that's the other thing I find is that, you know, it's one thing to have the human 
your rights, but it's another thing to be able to know what your rights are and then exercise your rights. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, quite often it, people might not realise that they've actually got a right or an entitlement. Yeah. I remember because I was working in that environment, I'd find myself in conversation with people and I'd say, well, you know, you should raise that with the ombudsman or you should raise that with this commissioner. And, um, and I remember someone once saying, oh, you know, you're like the squeaky, the squeaky wheel, you know, <laughs> the squeaky wheel gets more oil, you know, it's like, but you've got to raise these issues if you want to see any, you know, kind of um, uh, you know, them being fixed, which actually brings me to the topic justice and retribution, which is yes. one of the issues. How did that come about? What was the, what, what were the, some of the um, conversations that took place about around that theme? Well, the, we'd, we'd seen an interest come back from the audience on that. And then we were approached about uh, a, with a couple of films, and one of yeah. them is um, called Guilty, right? Which is about um, the execution of Myron Sugamaran, oh. and it basically looks at the story is about him as an artist yeah. in you know um, in his final days, and it sort of. It's sort of show, it's a film about redemption. Yeah. So I think that there's really interesting issues in this space about, you know, retribution, rehabilitation, yeah. redemption. And we've sort of got a couple of um, films in there that show this spectrum. Yeah. And so three films? We've got, we've got two. two. We've got two films. films. So right. the other one is the story of some people that have been released from prison and right. trying to get back into society in the US and relationships with family. And what and, their actual experience yeah, is. So yeah. it shows what that's like. Yeah, that's the land of the free. So yeah. it'll be really, I think the audience will really like it. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a... Because when I read that, I thought there's a lot that could come within that category. Oh, there's a huge yeah. amount. We had a, a project which Philanthropy was involved in. A number of trusts um, had been funding around what's called um, justice reinvestment. And the idea is that you fund programs that keep people out of prison and you look at all the different interventions that can be employed to achieve that, given that the experience of being in prison, um, you know, is rarely rehabilitative and rehabilitative. And also what you need to then run after people exit prison to ensure that they don't then um, reoffend. Yeah. And what we found really fascinating was we sort of built this framework around the actual um, period in which someone might be incarcerated and said, what are all the different stages in which they would intersect with the, um, the courts, you know, the, the, um, the police, um, programs that sit around uh, the prison time and then you know post-release programs and how do you fund them or ensure that they're more effective so that they actually achieve their objective which is to reduce incarceration rates and then how do you even go back further and look at some of the problems that might have led to um, you know people offending and then build and, and, and actually put additional funds into those programs and the idea is that you're, you're reinvesting the cost of um, incarcer you know, incarcerating um, a prisoner and saying to government, look, we can show that these programs are reducing numbers. So each time we reduce a number, that frees up this amount of money. Yeah. And then you can, you know, invest that yourselves into these programs and sort of trying to, you know, to shift the funding priorities. What what kind of things were working? That I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, we saw. I mean, you, you can. I mean, I'll give you one great example. Is a um, organisation called the Torch, which um, was set up by the CEO Kent Morris, is a, an Indigenous um, artist and just a fantastic advocate. Um, and he basically saw that that the prisoners, the Indigenous prisoners that he was working with, with, um, you know, teaching them art and, and sort of using that as a, you know, a therapy, but also a way of, you know, teaching them about their culture, um, that once they uh, left prison and they were um, put into programs that enabled them to keep painting and to keep, you know, mixing with other artists, that they were and assigned mentors, they weren't reoffending. Oh, that's so, amazing. Yeah, which was really like this very... Um, practical way in which to interact with them that would give them that sense of, of you know cultural you know connection but something to practically do as well 
And then they started to hold exhibitions so that the art could be exhibited and sold. Yeah. And then the proceeds from the sale of the artist's work would be held in trust and given to them so that when they left prison, they actually had funds. Aww. And it was just great. Yeah, really fantastic initiative. And so um, because I now work with a foundation that's aligned with the fashion industry, we started looking at, you know, are there opportunities to collaborate so that the art isn't just shown on canvas, yeah. but also in fashion. And so I've been, you know, talking to um, you know, different uh, fashion designers about, you know, some of this artwork is just stunning. You know, could you feature it on, you know, sort of um, scarves and clothes and, you know, and, and that would then be of interest to some of the female Indigenous prisoners as well as the male. But I, I sort of saw that as a way of of um, expanding the reach. Yeah. And yeah, so that's yeah. just one small example. But, that's, you know, you see lots of programs like that. That's that's great. That's great. I've got a, I've got a personal example that's fairly... Similar to that, yeah. I, I used to live in Kings Cross in in Sydney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, I was having dinner one day, and there was a quite a young lady. I, I'd say she was in well, in her teens still. Yeah, and um, she was crying and in a pretty desperate situation, and she was um, she was Aboriginal, and I just asked if was anything I could do to help her out and she actually asked if she could come and have, have a bath because she didn't have a, a bath yeah um, access to a bath and then when she was there we were chatting and she was in a really extreme situation that she needed to get out of so we bought her a, a plane ticket and a bus ticket to go see her family and gave her a yeah. phone with some mobile credit on it etc etc and um, we'd organized to pick her up the next day yeah. um, Anyway, the next day, oh, yeah. And then as she was leaving the, my place, she noticed that I had some paints and stuff like that. Yeah, and she was yeah. like, oh, I used to do art. I used to love it. And I was like, oh, I'd take some paints and take a canvas and, you know, yeah. take as much as you want. Anyway, next day we went to pick her up and she didn't turn up, which wasn't surprising because there's a lot of, it's very difficult to leave certain situations. Yeah. Then, about two months later, I'm walking down the main street of King's Cross and there's a whole crowd that's gathered around this stall and, of course, I had to have a sticky beak. Yeah. And it was her and she was selling paintings. Oh, that's superb. So yeah. she'd actually like, gone and painted in those two months and then... Yeah. Oh, goodness. Did you reach out and say hello? And... Oh, I said hello, but, I, you know, I didn't really make a big deal out of it. It was just... Yeah. It was just... It was a really... Yeah, it was good to see her work out a way that really worked for her, you yeah, know? Yeah, and gave her that sense of purpose and yeah. meaning. I mean, that that's often, you know, we've the Eason Family Foundation funds a lot of um, programs which are arts and culture based, but they're, they're, the main objective is about community connectedness and, yeah. and, and cultural development and using the arts as a way of bringing people together and giving them that sense of um, you know, ways in which to communicate beyond just con conversation. And, and, you know, when you see it in effect, it's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It is. It's, um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, in philanthropy you get presented with so many different issues that you can fund. And some people are moved by, you know, the environment. Some people are particularly concerned about the experience of, um, you know, uh, el uh, people who are um, elderly who are vulnerable. And you've got, um, you know, children's rights is always one that people... Um, feel moved by yeah. and animals. You have some people who feel particularly yes. strongly about, you know, um, preventing cruelty to animals, protecting animals who are, um, you know, uh, unhomed. And one of the things I find really interesting is, is everyone finding the thing that moves them. And in, you know, arts and culture, often arts and culture is, is sort of seen as, but is it indulgent to fund arts and culture? And, and often it sits across all of these other different areas. So it will sort of, you know, slice across social justice, Indigenous rights, women's rights, children's rights, you know, all of these different areas because it's about expressing those rights and giving people a vehicle in which to talk about them. And then often there's a, a, a sort of a huge therapeutic um, aspect to it as well. So it's much more complex than just, you know, here's a performance or here's a piece of artwork or... Uh, absolutely, you know. absolutely. And we see, we see that through the festival a lot. Just... Going back to something you'd mentioned before, and this is something I'm a bit curious about, the philanthropy space. Now, I know yeah. from uh, foreign aid what we used to have was a lot of 
you know, different players, big, small, going yeah. into very little countries and all having very discrete programs which, you know, weren't particularly well coordinated. How, yeah. how does the philanthropy sector organise itself to make sure that, you know, everyone's working together and there's no overlap or inefficiencies and there's sort of coherent approaches in yeah. individual sectors. Yeah, I mean, that that's the ideal. And there's certainly a lot of um, discussion now about how foundations can collaborate. And there's um, a peak. We have a Philanthropy Australia, which is the organisation that um, really drives a lot of the conferences and the seminars and you know bringing out international speakers to talk about best practice and and but there's there's a genuine um I mean one of the things there's, there's this saying which I think sums it up quite well which is you know if you've met one philanthropist you've met one philanthropist because yeah. every philanthropist is different and yeah. you know you, you see a lot of um themes overlapping and you'll see uh you know different networks where a group of funders will come together because they're funding in the same space and yeah. so they want to make sure that they're not duplicating and that, that what they're doing complements um, you know the work of government the work of NGOs but but it is still done in a way that's quite individual yeah. and the, the big movement recently has been this idea of, of trying to evaluate impact so yeah. that that can then inform um, the distribution so that it isn't just this sort of endless you know, responding to every request that comes in yeah. and, and trying to sort of meet all the requests, but actually being a bit more structured and strategic in the way that you fund. And it's it's endlessly fascinating. It's one of the reasons why, you know, when I'm promoting philanthropy to people um, who are setting up trusts and foundations, I sort of say to them, you know, you'll never be bored. This is one of the most interesting, you know, areas to work in or to, to be involved in because what you really see is people who are trying to come up with solutions to very big problems and tackling it in different ways. And often, um, you know, one solution is complemented by another. Yeah. And that's when we were talking before about, you know, I was saying to you one of the reasons why I imagine people would look to fund the Human Rights um, Arts and Film Festival is because, you know, if they were trying to, um, you know, fund in a particular area, funding the festival would complement that often because of the types of films that you're playing and the different areas that you're focusing on. And yeah. so it wouldn't be a sort of an either or approach. It would actually be, well, let's sort of have a, you know. A, a suite of things suite, that are making a difference. A suite of approaches. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, the festival definitely does do that. I mean, if we pull out something like our theme of gender equality. Yeah. yeah. There's a huge amount of films in there that are creating this awareness it's probably you know there's um a film on domestic violence in there which you know really shines a light on it in a way that i haven't seen anything do no reports no statistics no programs for quite quite a long a long time that you know if you if you weren't actually working in this space and got that bird's eye view it would really it, it would really help educate you yeah, on it, you know. Yeah. And I think that if you do have programs that are in place, this the festival's very complementary to yeah. to these other activities. If you've got a project working in a space like that, it's very complementary to to these activities. And you'll often see that in philanthropy where a film will come out. There was one recently that was made, or probably not so recently, probably a couple of years ago, but it was about um, problem gambling. And I think it was called I Ching or Kuching, Kuching. Oh, I haven't seen it. And a lot of the foundations that were funding um, in that particular area, you know, held a, a screening and went and saw it together and used that as a, um, you know, sort of a catalyst for, you know, further debate so you know you do see those films playing that role yeah and I mean one of the great examples is the sugar film do you remember that was a um you know a, an enormous um shift in people's understanding of you know the effects of sugar because we sort of had all you know seen it being played out in in the media and played out in um you know different forums but that film really um, crystallized it for a lot of people. Oh, th there's so many examples. When we sort of, when I go back and I think about, okay, where are those pivotal points in history where I've been educated on something or, you know, I've changed my view or there's quite often a film there. I mean, yeah. they, they really do change the world. It might not yeah. seem so direct, but when we reflect back on it, yeah, it, it does. Um, have there been any films or books or photos that have changed your world? Yeah, well, I was, 
I was thinking about that. Have you um, heard of a podcast by Malcolm Gladwell called yes. um, The Revisionist, Revisionist History? Have you... I ha- I've heard of it. I haven't, oh. I haven't so, listened so to he, it. So he looked at a picture which had been used um, in the civil rights movement and it was of a, um, a dog lunging at a protester. And it was, you know, this, this photo that sort of had really, you know, sent, you know, shocks through um, society. And he actually goes back and talks to the different people who were involved in that picture. And it was fascinating because it made you realise how, um, you know, the, the story that actually sat behind that photo wasn't really the, the, the story that people had inferred from looking uh. at that photo. But the photo nonetheless had a very strong um, you know, resonance, which was, you know, that people who were, you know, fighting for rights, you know, shouldn't be, um, you know, sort of, you know, lunged at, you know, with police force and, and you know, and dogs. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to me the power of photography and those, those, those moments that, that have shifted, you know, people's, like the one you referred to earlier about the little boy washed up on the shore. Yeah. And the one of... Um, uh, in the Vietnam War. The girl who'd been struck by napalm, who's yeah. running down the street. Yep. Yeah, and I can't think about Abu Ghraib without the photo of the the hooded yes. Um, yes. men. I think every... Actually, I studied history and, you know, I've read a lot of history books, but whenever I think about a war... I've always got a photo. Yeah, yeah, it's the visual yeah. Yeah, images. Yeah. Um, or the speeches. I find the speeches will often, little oh, snippets yeah. of the speeches will stay. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, a, the or there's particularly some of the good speeches like Winston Churchill. Yes, he gave such strong speeches. He was a fantastic orator. I don't think there's anyone really. I mean, that, that's actually one of the things I loved about Obama was how beautifully he spoke. Yeah. And I miss that now because, you know, obviously... Um, the current administration doesn't seem to have quite that same <laughs> ability to lift the, the you know, the, um, the world's spirits with no. language and rhetoric. Um, but no, in terms of films, I mean, I think it's funny you talk about people who work in social justice and the law and so many of lawyers of my vintage will, you know, talk about To Kill a Mockingbird as one of the, you know, moments where they thought this is just, you know, um, injustice and... Well, you know what? I mean, ironically, that that book actually showed that it didn't matter how well that lawyer advocated, you know, for his client. In actual fact, the client was convicted anyway. So I don't know why it is that that's a good example to give. But it was that idea of of the role of of the law, um, or the rule of the law, and and that desire to to use it to see, you know, the world get better. And yeah, so many people have been influenced by that book. Yeah. It's amazing how these things can just change people's trajectory, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it is fun. And fun things about, you know, when you see a, a good documentary, you just think, oh, my goodness, like, you know, what, what a, an extraordinary achievement to have, you know, sort of pulled it all together and with that coherence and, you know, and all the different elements that have to be put in. Yeah. Have you got a favourite in this festival that you would recommend? <sighs> I've got quite a few. Uh I think after the apology, the opening night film about oh, Aboriginal yes. children being removed is a must see. It's yep. really powerful and really important. Um, a Better Man, which is the film I was talking about a bit earlier about um, domestic violence. So it, it follows a woman who was in an abusive relationship and meeting up with her form, former abuser to talk it through and ex- sort of get a sense of how it happened and the oh, impact of goodness. it and understand it. And it's, um, you know, it covers the discussion between the two of, two of them. It's a, yeah. it's a hard film to watch, but yeah. it's pretty powerful. Um, this is Congo, which... Right, this is Congo. I haven't heard of that one. Is that <gasps> it is. international? Yeah, yep. it's international. It is mind-blowing because the Congo's had conflict for 20 years. Yeah. You know, it's... Um, it's got this proliferation of um, uh, armed groups within the country and it's just, it's such a powerful film. You know, I think quite often with uh, films about conflict, what you have is a a narrative that's good versus bad. Yes, that tells you which side to side with. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this film just goes through everything. It has the history. It has, you know, the impact of natural resource wealth on countries. Um, it has the different drive. It interviews lots of different perspectives of people that are fighting and gets the perspective of everyone. It looks at, you know, how people 
people survive the horror of war. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, I couldn't look away. It was astounding. Yeah. And so what the, what's that one this called? This is Congo. This is Congo. Yeah, it's a brilliant film. Um, uh, another one, I used to work in the Pacific for seven years, so Latest in Waiting is a very good film. Is so about sea rising? No, no, it's about in Tonga, yeah. transgender um, people have been, long been a part of the culture there and usually yeah. um, quite often are associated with the royal family or right. um, working alongside the royal family. But what we've been seeing in the Pacific is this sort of rise of religious fundamentalism yes, yes. that's basically really trying to clamp down on um, the rights of transgender so, people. So that's been one of the, the consequences of there being this greater presence of, of you know, religion being brought to those islands. Yeah, so right. very, it's all, the religion can quite often be very fire and brimstone kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, that film basically explores this but in the beautiful way where there's a lot of joy and fun and colour and sadness and um, yeah it just brings the issue to life and it, it just won the People's Choice Award at the oh, really? yeah at the Commonwealth Film Festival a couple of days ago oh, wow. right. so yeah that's a that's a really great film as well yeah do you know it's interesting and I could probably end the, the discussion on this note but I think one of the strangest things that we have in common is that we've both been to Kiribati because when you talked ah, about working in the Pacific... You, you hardly ever meet people that have been, been to Kiribati. I don't. I've been there a lot. Yeah, so the um, uh, company that I used to work for managed the Sovereign Fund, which had been oh. set up as compensation for all the... Fishery stuff? Yeah, uh, No, the um, phosphorus, which had oh. been mined. Oh, and okay. So, yeah, and the, um, the experience was extraordinary going there. It was just not... and And... Flying in and just seeing that beautiful blue water the and palm trees, thing, yeah. and then finding out that you couldn't swim in it because it was contaminated With and fecal matter, yeah, and, and, and the water lens is contaminated. Absolutely, and, and I did some um, spent some time at the hospital there because we were looking at different ways in which we could fund some initiatives there, so that we weren't just there managing money, but we could actually talk about the experience of the people on the island. And some of the things that we saw coming through the emergency department, you know, you don't see them in a developed world. No, no. And it is a very um, quite extreme situation in Kiribati. Yeah. You know, what you have is a lot of people coming out from those low-lying atolls that are that yeah. have been inundated. Yeah. And then they're coming into the mainland, which has made it one of the most densely populated yes. places in the world. Yes. It's, I know. Even though it's so small. It's so small and long and thin yeah. and you can, yeah, I know, it's and, extraordinary. And just it's a really difficult life, you know. you sort of sea locked into this place where there's not many opportunities. You're at the coal face of climate change. Yes, you know, absolutely. You're... Sea rising levels is actually something that's happening on, on the, the, the edges of yeah, this island. You can see yeah. it. You can yeah. see the water coming over and, yeah. you know, they've got king tides coming through, destroying what crops they can grow. It's just, um, it's a real eye-opener. Yeah, it is. I mean, when people talk about environmental refugees, and I yeah. imagine a lot of people think, oh, well, what does that really mean? Yeah. If you ever want to know what that means, you go and... Go is to it Kiribati. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's and weird. work having worked in fashion. <laughs> yeah. <they're laughs> How often do you see those two issues come up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it was um, it was so good to talk to you. Yeah, I really you enjoyed this discussion. Thank yeah. you very much. And Thank for you. anyone who's watching this after the film festival's taken place, which is May yes. this, this year. This week. This week. Yeah, in a couple of days we're starting. And so will it be every May? Is it always in May? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then other um, events throughout the year. Yes. Yeah. So www.harafhraff.org.au. <laughs> I once had someone say to me, oh, you don't say the www anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. I'm like a dinosaur. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's supposed to just say harafhraff.com.au. <laughs> uh, thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, it's really thanks. good.